I want to start today by pointing out the fact that even though it is very warm outside, I am wearing a suit jacket. And I wear a suit jacket to absolutely every interview and ever ma every major speaking opportunity that I have. And it's not for the reasons that you might think. Like naturally, a suit jacket will look nice in a job interview. But the real reason, if you want the, the inside scoop as to why I wear a suit jacket every time I have something very important, is because I sweat nonstop. And a suit jacket is the only thing that really truly covers up the pit stains when I am nervous, when I am, my heart is beating out of my chest, when I'm shaking. This is the only thing that makes me seem cool and collected. So today we're going to talk about nerves and courage. The framework which I'm going to talk about it mainly is interview skills, but I want you to think about an interview when I say interview, that is any high stakes communication, any conversation that you may have, any presentation that you may be giving, anywhere where there is a conversation or an interaction that is going to raise your heart rate and require you to be out of your comfort zone. A little bit about me before we move forward. My, again, my name is Eric Dominguez. I am the owner of Speak Up Stories. My mission is to eradicate fearful and ineffective speaking and storytelling. So I help individuals, groups, and organizations in creating cultures of ongoing public speaking skills that's done through classes, through workshops like these, and through keynotes that I give in any sort of public speaking presentation. And I want you to help me define two things. First is, what is public speaking? What is communication? And two, what is courage? So if you want to unmute yourself and, uh, and uh, define either public speaking or courage for me, I'd love to hear from you. This is a perfect time to practice your public speaking. <laughs> This is this is what uh, I was a classroom educator for many years, and this is what we call teacher wait time. So we're trained to ask a question and then just <laughs> as awkward okay. as it may be, just sit and wait for someone to boldly respond. Okay, so you ask, what is public speaking? What is public speaking? Speaking in front of multiple people. Um, whether it's a presentation or interview or a talk. Okay, good. Anybody else want to add to that? I would only adjust to this. My definition of public speaking is anytime you open your mouth and words come out. So you are public speaking when you have a conversation with a friend. You are public speaking when you're in a job interview. You're public speaking when you're speaking to thousands of people. The reason why I, I put that frame of reference in your mind is that you get to always be practicing public speaking and communication. The more we think, I'm sorry, the less we think of public speaking as this event, as something that is going to happen next Tuesday when I give a presentation, and the more we think of it as I'm waking up and I'm practicing my public speaking, the better we will be and the calmer we will be when we're actually put in that high stress situation. Well, thank you very much, Debbie. I appreciate you uh, speaking up. How about somebody else defining courage? What is courage? Pressing the unmute button. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mary, can you repeat that? I'm sorry. I, sure, I, I said pressing the unmute button. Pressing the <laughs> unmute button. That's amazing. That is absolutely amazing. You're right. Courage is pressing the unmute button. Mary, tell me why that's courageous. Why pre is pressing the unmute button courageous? Oh, you're, you're putting yourself out there in front of everybody. Absolutely. You are being vulnerable. You are exposing your thoughts and ideas to other people. Now, when you mix those two together, when you're public speaking, you're always having some sort of courage. When you're expressing yourself, you're always having to have courageous conversations. The way that I define courage is being afraid, 
and doing it anyway. I don't have courage when I eat pizza because I love pizza. It's easy, right? I have courage when I have tough conversations with the people that I love. I have courage when I'm in a high stakes situation. So because we have courage and because we have public speaking, because public speaking is anytime you open your mouth, here's another layer of secrets. Fear, okay, is for everyone. Fear is for everyone. One thing I forgot to mention is I love, if you're writing notes, write, write all the notes. I do have a one page document that you are gonna get afterwards. So keep writing if you're writing, if you're, you know, season, whatever, however you learn best is great. But I do wanna make sure that you know that there's a, a summary on this a little bit later. What I wanna do now is I wanna show you a two minute section of a video that explains why it is that we get so nervous when we are in front of an audience. It's the scientific reasoning behind it. So here we go. Give me a thumbs up when you're able to hear us. Palms sweaty, heart racing, stomach in knots. You can't cry for help. Not only is your throat too tight to breathe, but it'd be so embarrassing. No, you aren't being stalked by a monster. You're speaking in public. A fate some deem worse than death. See, when you're dead, you feel nothing. At a podium, you feel stage fright. But at some point, we all have to communicate in front of people. So you have to try and overcome it. To start, understand what stage fright is. Humans, social animals that we are, are wired to worry about reputation. Public speaking can threaten it. Before a speech, you fret. What if people think I'm awful, that I'm an idiot? That fear of being seen as an awful idiot is a threat reaction from a primitive part of your brain that's very hard to control. It's the fight or flight response, a self-protective process seen in a range of animals, most of which don't give speeches. But we have a wise partner in the study of freaking out. Charles Darwin tested fight or flight at the London Zoo's snake exhibit. He wrote in his diary, my will and reason were powerless against the imagination of a danger which had never been experienced. He concluded that his response was an ancient reaction unaffected by the nuances of modern civilization. So to your conscious modern mind, it's a speech. To the rest of your brain, built up to code with the law of the jungle, when you perceive the possible consequences of blowing a speech, it's time to run for your life or fight to the death. Hypothalamus, come to all vertebrates, triggers your pituitary gland to secrete the hormone ACTH, making your adrenal glands shoot adrenaline into your blood. Your neck and back tense up, you slouch. Your legs and hands shake as your muscles prepare for attack. You sweat, your blood pressure jumps. Your digestion shuts down to maximize the delivery of nutrients and oxygen to muscles and vital organs, so you can try mouth butterflies. Your pupils dilate. It's hard to read anything up close, like your nose. But long range is easy. That's how stage fright works. How do we fight it? First, perspective. This isn't all in your head. It's a natural, hormonal, full body reaction by an autonomic nervous system on autopilot. And genetics play a huge role in social anxiety. John Lennon played live thousands of times, each time he vomited beforehand. Some people are just wired to feel more scared performing in public. Since stage fright is natural and inevitable, focus on what you can control. Practice. A lot, starting long before in an environment similar to the real performance. Practicing any task increases your familiarity and reduces anxiety, so when it's time to speak in public, you're confident in yourself and the task at hand. Steve Jobs rehearses epic speeches for hundreds of hours, starting weeks in advance. If you know what you're saying, you'll feed off the crowd's energy instead of letting your hypothalamus convince your body it's about to be lunch for a pack of predators. But hey, the vertebrate hypothalamus has had millions of years more practice than you. Just before you go on stage, it's time to fight dirty and trick your brain. Stretch your arms up and breathe deeply. This makes your hypothalamus trigger a relaxation response. Stage fright usually hits hardest right before a presentation, so take that last minute to stretch and breathe. You approach the mic, voice clear, body relaxed. Your well-prepared speech convinces the loud crowd you're a charismatic genius. How? Huh? You didn't overcome stage fright. You adapted to it. 
and to the fact that no matter how civilized you may seem, in part of your brain, you're still a wild animal. A profound, well-spoken wild animal. Let me close that out. Awesome. What were some of the things that stood out to you in that video? Oops, hold on a second. I still have my... My name is Danish. Oh, goodness. And my full-time job is to count people mm -hmm. than us. The and video us. is still working. Give me just a second. My first day of school. After my family moved from Pakistan to Tanzania, I was busy sketching my dream cars. All right. My apologies for that. What are some of the things that came up for you in that first video, not the audio that I forgot to turn off? Go ahead, Barb. Move to focus on what we can control. I like the tip on stretching and deep breathing. That's a good one. Absolutely. Focusing on what you can control. Great. What else did you, did you notice? The rehearsing so you build your confidence in what you're saying. You bet. In a minute, I'm gonna give you some technical aspects. When I say technical aspects, some just practical solutions on how to calm your nerves. But before I go into that, I wanna point something really important out, which is biologically, we are meant to get nervous in high stakes situations. So a lot of people, when I'm training them in their public speaking skills, they, they'll say, they'll, they'll tell me, well, they, I get overwhelmed or I have dry mouth or all of these things happen. And they'll, they'll have a sense of shame because they will see other people speak confidently. This happens to absolutely everybody because our brains are wired to recognize that when we are opening our mouths and being vulnerable, we are up for judgment. We are up for rejection. We are up for a lot of the prices that we pay when we are putting ourselves out there. Now, some people, uh, when I give this presentation, will say, well, I know someone who doesn't get nervous. Or somebody will say, well, I don't get nervous at all. Here's the response to that. Saying I don't get nervous, and, and I believe them, and if you're one of them, I believe you that you're incredibly calm and have no problems standing up in front of a crowd. But that is, again, a mechanism that the brain does to shift away from the pain and the intensity. So the people who feel like, oh, I'm, I'm fine, everything's okay, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter at all, it's, it's a defense mechanism to downplay the intensity or what's at stake in the actual speaking event. So it, it's a similar skill. I'm sorry, it's a similar, similar skill from the brain to adapt to the speaking situation. There's still nerves there. They're just showing up a little bit differently. So what I'd love to do first is I want to give you some real technical aspects on how to calm your nerve and how to present yourself more courageously. These are kind of the, the back ends, the things that you do before you speak. And then after we do that, we're gonna dive into some role playing and some scenarios where we talk about the abstract aspects of courageous communication. So the first thing, these are all tricks. These are all tricks for your body and your brain. And some of them are a little goofier than others. The first thing is, I'm gonna share my screen one more time, is an acupressure ring. You can, hopefully you can see this. Acupressure rings, are not acupuncture rings. I'm not suggesting you get acupuncture on your, on your fingers at all. But these acupressure rings that you can get them for in bulk for not, very, not a whole lot of money. And they just go around your fingers. The great thing about them is, is that they're not very expensive. The bad thing about them is, is that they get lost easy. So I had two of them right here on this table and somehow they walked away. But what they do is when you put them on your finger and you squeeze, all of your nervous energy can go right into that particular element. So it looks like a ring. And in the context of interviews, you can always have it in your hand and it's not necessarily present, especially if it's a Zoom interview, if it's a virtual interview, nobody will know that I'm hanging on to an acupressure ring. You can do this with any sort of object. Sometimes I hold a pencil, just 
to you know, make sure that you're not breaking the pencil, but sometimes just squeezing the pencil like so. That releases the energy. I'm squeezing the pencil as hard as I possibly can. You probably cannot tell that I'm releasing energy and that I'm breathing energy out. Sometimes our bodies just need that release. My favorite tip for calming down nerves in courageous conversations is still a pencil. This is everybody's favorite. It's my favorite to show off because it makes me look goofy. And you put it in the back of your mouth like this. And you don't want to do this in the actual conversation. If you're having a really intense conversation, I don't suggest you doing this. But what I do is if I have a presentation and I'm driving to the presentation, I put a pencil in my mouth. This does a few things. The first thing it does is that it stretches my facial muscles out. So I'm actually naturally more expressive than I was before I had the pencil in my mouth. The second thing is, is that I over enunciate. A lot of times when we are nervous in courageous conversations, we have the tendency to talk really faster and we also have the tendency to mumble. We start talking like this because it's much easier to speak like this. And when we speak like this, more nerves are coming out. So when we have the pencil in our mouths, we tend to open up our mouths a little bit more and be uh, more easily heard. Okay, the next trick, this is a little Mr. Rogers. Everybody will wear a shoe. Uh, I'm not currently wearing shoes. No shame if you're not wearing shoes, but if you're in a face-to-face -face meeting, if you're in a face-to-face -face interaction, whether it's a speaking opportunity or an interview, what I do is I take some tissue, just a few tissues like this, make it a, a pretty sizable ball, and I put it in my shoe. Then I put my shoe on, and what that does is that it becomes uncomfortable, not painful, not so much that it's, it's distracting, but just enough of a distraction where I'm sensing something different. I'm sensing something out of the norm. I've seen some people do this tissue trick. If you wear rings, another great trick is to take the ring where you usually wear and wear it on a different finger. Or if you don't usually wear a necklace, wear a necklace, something conspicuous that would make you feel just slightly off. What that does is that is a, a physical reminder of whatever it is that you need to be reminded of. For me, it's slowing down. I get really excited about talking and then I just, I just start blurting out everything out. And so I have to make myself calmer and make sure that I am speaking at an eloquent pace. Okay. Another few tips that I do, one is uh, the day of an important interview or speaking event, I have an extra workout. When I, say, say, when I say an extra workout, I usually call it a plus one workout. If you're not used to marathon running, don't wake up that morning and start running a marathon. That's not, that's not a good idea. What I mean is push yourself a little bit further than you normally do. So if you are used to a two mile walk, go on a three mile walk. If you're used to uh, cycling 10 miles, go 12 miles, just enough to get a lot of that nervous energy out. Water, 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 very basic, but very true. When we don't drink enough water, we're gonna have cotton mouth. Daily meditation. When you're having ongoing courageous conversations or you're preparing for uh, a, a significant job interview, meditation helps the mind move itself away. I use Headspace. A lot of their programs are completely free. I resisted meditation for a very long time for a lot of different reasons until a coach of mine said that meditation is like building the foundation of a house one coat of paint at a time. And so you're just doing this every day for a very, very, very long time. The way that I've seen it help in my speaking abilities is that I'm able to take whatever pain, whatever distraction might be going on in my head, and I am able to release it and move it aside. The last thing that I want you to be aware of, the last technical solution, 
is something that's going to be uh, on the follow-up uh, handout. I am going to type it in the chat right now. It is a, a TED Talk, and it is called Your, Lang Your Body Language Shapes Who You Are. If you get nothing out of what I say, if you just think, that guy had a weird shirt and he said he sweat a lot, that's great, that's fine. If you get zero things, please, 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 I implore you, watch this TED Talk. It is about how the way we sit, stand, and present ourselves communicates not just to others, but to ourselves. And the first 15 minutes, you're going to get some really good information. In the last five minutes, you're going to get a knockout punch from this speaker. Most of you have heard the phrase, fake it till you make it, right? She gives a completely different interpretation of fake it till you make it. Because fake it till you make it is, is, is great, but it has some limitations. And she shares a personal story about body language, about mentality, about faking it till you make it that is out of this world. Okay, so those are some technical solutions. Those are the check marks. Those are the things that you can do. For lack of better words, those are the tricks, right? They might help you, they might not help you. Some people, they help more than others. Let's dig into some of the abstract uh, aspects of courageous conversations. What I'm going to need is I'm going to need someone to interview here. So I need to be, I need someone to apply for a job with me. Who's going to be it? This is another one of those teacher wait times. Excellent. Violetta, is, am, am I saying that right? That is correct. Excellent. How are you today, Violetta? I am good. How are you? I am doing well. Uh, let's pretend that you are uh, interviewing for a job. Let's, let's make up a job for Violetta. Let's make her something wacky. What, what, could, what could be a wacky, fun job? for Violetta. Yes, Barb. A clown at a children's hospital. A ch clown at a children's <laughs> hospital. Okay, that sounds great. Violetta, you have studied to be a clown for years. You have trained, you have done internships, you are ready to rock and roll, okay? So I am the director of the Children's Hospital, and you are my, uh, you are my potential clown at this uh, hospital. The first thing I want to ask you, is, not, not in the actual interview, but I want to ask you, Violetta, and I'm going to pose this to everybody, who's in control of the interview? I am, unless I give you control of it. Mm, tell me more about that. Well... I think, you know, if I'm afraid and I let you take it over, you're going to ask me all these questions and I'm going to be afraid. I'm just going to think, oh, I'm going to fail. I cannot do it. And then that way it gives you control or like even saying like, well, she's not perfect for the job. In the other hand, answers that you want to hear, yeah. then, you know, it is, I mean, the answers that you want to hear that are absolutely true. And then that way, you know, like, Oh, sorry. That's I'm okay. That's okay. Say that last part one more time. I, I cut it. I cut out, not you. What was the last part one more time? I said, you know, like, if, um, give me just one. No problem. No problem. One thing I want to jump on with what she said that was really, really great is the control aspect. It has to do with whether or not you get the job, right? So, so Violetta, go ahead and, and finish your thought. So then basically I was saying, you know, like, if I give you control of it, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, if I don't give you control of it, then I basically have control of what I want to do and even like getting the job. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So not just in interviews, but in any high stakes conversation or situation, you you are interviewing that person, you're interviewing that organization as much as they are interviewing you. If you're having a tough conversation between a coworker, um, if you're having a tough conversation, if you're presenting to the board of directors, 
remember that they are going to receive the benefit as much as you are. So on that, I want to encourage you, and I'm going to type it in the chat, something a little bit odd. Celebrate rejection. Now, Violetta, if you and I had the interview and you did great, you walked out of there and you're like, nailed it. I had the references. I did, you know, had a great resume. I showed them my clown skills. It was fantastic. And then I give you a call later that day and I say, sorry, we decided to go to, to someone else. Tell me how you, how you would feel. I think at the beginning I would be very disappointed because I would be like, well, you know, I tried so hard. I have all the credentials. I did my homework. I think it's very unfair that I didn't get the job. I will probably, you know, that was my first reaction and I will give myself time to go through that. And then after that, I'm gonna be like, well, you know, like everything happens for a reason. There is a plan and maybe like, this is not the best job for me for whatever reason. And this is it, you know, let's get up and go to the next one. I love your perspective. I absolutely love it. It's like you're taking away from my notes right, right away. Yes, feel those feelings. Rejection never feels great. I'm a terrible, terrible golfer. But when I go out with my friends and I, I ask who wants to be my golfing buddy and they don't respond, that still feels terrible. I know why. I'm not a good golfer. Like it's, it's, not, it's just what it is. But it still feels kind of bad. It feels worse in high stakes communications because we're really putting ourselves out there. What I want to, the phrase that I want you to keep in mind is this. Feedback is neutral. You not getting a job is oftentimes more neutral than not. Here's what I mean. Or, and again, I'm extending this to, to any sort of uh, courageous conversation. If you don't get the desired outcome, that's okay. It is feedback, but it very rarely means that they didn't like you, that you're not a good person. And sometimes it, it means that you're completely qualified, but there's just something else that wasn't the case. So I follow the three C's of hiring, okay? The three C's of hiring. When I'm interviewing someone and when I'm being interviewed by someone, I keep these in mind. Competency, character, and chemistry, okay? And you can apply this to all of your courageous conversations. Competency is just, are you qualified to do the job, right? Violetta, in this mock interview, you would be qualified because you went to school to be a clown for three years and you did a year-long internship. You are competent as a children's clown. Myself, Let me stop you on that. I actually have a PhD on how to be a oh, clown. Oh, there you go. Exactly. So you're, and thank you so much. <laughs> My apologies, doctor. Uh, <laughs> so you are very qualified to be a, a children's hospital clown. Uh, I would never apply to be a DNA sequencer because I don't know anything about DNA sequencing. I have a friend who does. She works uh, at an organization and company and she does DNA sequencing and I can never figure out what she's doing. I would not be competent as a DNA sequencer. Violetta, you're going to be more than competent as a, as a uh, children's hospital clown. The next section, which is sometimes difficult to discern in an interview or in a conversation, is character. Now, when I say character, I just mean, are you a person of your word? It doesn't mean that we haven't made mistakes, but are you someone who's going to be a good teammate? Are you someone who's going to play team, be honest with yourself and with the people around you? But the last C is chemistry. And this has happened to me on both ends of the table, when I'm being interviewed or when I'm interviewing someone. When I'm having a courageous conversation or a presentation, both times have been rejected. When I say chemistry, it's, it's being able to relate and connect. Here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that there's not going to be significant differences between personalities, but it is 
do I get the sense when I'm interviewing you that we can have a disagreement and still be positive and cordial, right? There is no workplace without disagreement. There is no workplace without disagreement. Disagreement isn't bad. That's why we have coworkers. That's why we have committees because we get to choose our, I'm sorry, we get to pick out each other's blind spots. Those are good, good things. We want to say, I don't really agree with that or let's look at it from this perspective. And some of those times, those disagreements can turn into arguments because again, we're being vulnerable with our opinions on what's going on. Where the trick is, where kind of the the linchpin is, is what's gonna happen if Yoletta, you and I hire you, and then we have a disagreement on the color of balloons that we should use in the children's hospital. And you say, what what color do you think they should be? I think um, blue and red. I'm sorry, Violetta, but we have tried blue and red, and they just have continued to fail. We must do orange and purple. And so, go ahead, Violetta, go ahead. What is it about the blue and the red balloons that that it's failing? Oh, good. See, that's, Violetta, I continue to be impressed with you. That is a very good question. And her and I can have this discussion. Um, she put the ball in my court instead of attacking me. Now I get to say, well, the blues are twice as expensive and they draw the eyes. I don't know. I'm making things up here. But her and I can have this discussion. And whether we choose her colors or my colors, I need to be able to see her the next day or see her at lunch and feel confident that we are both seen and heard. Sometimes there are things in courageous conversations that cue us consciously or subconsciously that the chemistry isn't going to be there. You know, there's been times when people have gotten jobs that I applied for and I saw, oh, well, so they, so-and-so knew, knew so-and-so and so that's why they got the job. And at first I get like, I'm so angry, but it makes sense because we, we, we go to the familiar and because there's connections there, they know that that chemistry piece is going to be uh, is going to be there. Any comments, reactions, or questions on those three C's of hiring and how they can apply to any sort of courageous conversation? Okay, that was good. Good teacher wait time. All right, tell me what's the one. M- What's the most popular interview question that there is? It's one that makes me cringe. Yes, go ahead, Barb. Tell me about a time when. Oh, tell, okay, good. Tell me about a time when. That's not the one I had in mind, but that's a good one too. Tell me about yourself. Tell me about yourself. Oh, why do I hate that question? I mean, I know why I hate that question. If anybody else dislikes that question, tell me why you might dislike that question. Go ahead, Barb. We don't like talking about ourselves. We don't like bragging about ourselves. We tend to throw ourselves down, if anything. Exactly. Most of the time, we've been taught, don't brag, don't, don't uh, boast about your accomplishments. And tell me about yourself is, it's the time to brag, especially in a job interview. Now, this looks different in different courageous conversations. If you're having, if you're presenting to the board, tell me about yourself is really tell me the purpose behind why you're here. My recommendation when you're digging into this abstract aspect of this communication is include the competency, character, and chemistry of yourself. So, Violetta, you're going to tell us about yourself and your PhD in clowning but I want you to just speak naturally, speak fluently. And I want you to try and incorporate competency, meaning that you are qualified for this job. I want you to speak a little bit about your character. And I want you to speak a little bit about the chemistry that you would give in in this workplace. Here's what I don't want you to do. I don't want you to say, 
I have good character and I can be, and I can have good chemistry in the workplace. I want you to show me, not tell me. Okay. I know I'm putting you on the spot, Violetta. So you do your best. Okay. So I want you to know that since I was a little kid, since I was about three or four, I always enjoy making other people laugh. And I always thought that I should be able to do that as a career because then I would not see it as a job. Because of that, I went on to um, get my bachelor's degree. Then I went to get a master's degree and eventually a PhD that would allow me to work in hospitals. As you know, as I was growing up, I used to tell uh, my grandfather that's what I wanted to do. And he used to tell me that that's something that I needed to keep in mind. And I made a promise to him, you know, that I would never forget that keeping in mind, you know, like the way I was raised. And now having a PhD and applying for this job makes me think that I fulfilled that promise to him that I would go on to be a clown for a hospital. And I think, you know, being able to work with children as I have done throughout my entire life, that gives me a great opportunity to keep on, you know, and I have some kids of my own as well that keep me on my toes. So I have a great experience when it comes to working with children and keeping them happy and making them laugh and trying to make their life a little bit better. Deal Violetta, I want to go get a job as the children's director of a children's hospital and just give you a job. That was amazing. That was so incredible. I'm totally floored. Here's why it was so incredible. One, competency. A lot of times we can't avoid uh, telling rather than showing in terms of a competency. Here's my degrees. Here's my experience. This is what I have been through. The character portion you talked about uh, keeping a promise to a family member what that shows me is if you keep a long-term promise to your family member shows integrity shows that you do what you say you're going to do and then when you talk about children especially talking about the fact that you have children and that you have experience with children you, you, you don't get to have children and not be able to work through some really sticky situations, sometimes actually sticky situations, but, but also some really difficult conflicts. And so you nailed it. You talked about your competency, you talked about your character, and you talked about your chemistry. I'm willing to work with you. I know that you're gonna be a person of your word, and I know that you have the skills to be able to fulfill the job duties. I'd love to hear from some of you all, what are some of the other contexts that you might need to incorporate this competency character and chemistry into? What are some of the other uh, high stakes conversations or situations that you might uh, face in, in applying this? I think when you're asking for a raise at your place of employment. Oh, good. When you're asking for a raise, how, how would you ask for a raise, Yoletta? Oh, I have done it. I have failed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Tell, tell me about that. Well, I uh, basically talk about, you know, like since when I have been there and everything I have done, all the times that I have gone above and beyond, all the times that I have stepped in, for someone who didn't do the work or someone who left and how I had to teach myself how to do things in order to do my job or do their job as part of my job. And because of that, you know, that I was able to, that I felt that I deserve, you know, um, a raise. And also because since I was the only Spanish speaking person there for a while, that I was not only, uh, that I was actually saving them money when it came to interpretation in Spanish that they didn't have to hire an interpreter, that they could just use me and that because I do a lot of interpretation, I go on as personally and I pay for some education so that I could keep my um, interpretation skills up to date. So I brought that up and I asked for a meeting with them. The meeting um, got postponed and everything. So I ended up writing a very professional email that I, f I felt it was very professional and 
basically putting those points there and telling them how I felt and, and why I felt that I needed the raise. Okay, and, they, and the raise was denied? Correct. Okay, how did they deny you the raise? They said that um, we are, um, basically it was just another email saying, we have all of you guys in a category and if we raise your wage, we feel that we should also do it for the other um, legal assistants. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know, this is what I bring to the table that the other legal assistants do not bring to the table. Mm -hmm. But if you must raise their salaries so that you can raise mine, then by all means, raised out of our salaries. And then that they, um, then I was told that there was no money to increase the salaries of everyone. Great. Uh, Violeta, can I give you some feedback on, yeah. on that? So the first step is, first of all, I acknowledge you for taking that bold step. That is really difficult conversation to have, to be able to say, to, to know your worth and to say, this is what I'm worth and this is where I want us to be. What I would suggest and recommend for you in the future when you're having these types of courageous conversations, uh, and I would have encouraged you to continue to persist to have that face-to-face -face meeting. Um, if they're pushing you to email, um, email is okay, but you're vi you are so charismatic, Violetta, and you are so quick off your feet. And I feel like I want to have you in person to have that conversation. The second thing that I would suggest to all of you, and I'm going to write this in the chat as well, is the phrase that I've learned this year, which is enroll in their vision. So I agree that you get to highlight the things that you brought to the table. A different approach is getting them to talk about what you bring to the table. So for example, the fact that you're bilingual, okay, I would bring up the fact, how, how has my ability to translate aided in this organization? Let them do more of the talking, okay? Then continue to ask, what are some of the things that are in the gap for me right now, okay? Don't wait for your formal evaluations to request a, an evaluation. You're constantly having the can I get a raise conversation. You're, you're having that conversation from day one. And the way that you have that is you're continually providing value and you're showing how not only how you're providing value, but finding opportunities to express where your gaps are. So as you're building this, as you're talking about where you provide value, you're bilingual, you're, do, you're going out of the way, you're recognizing, hey, I would love to, to improve in this area. When you actually have the conversation, they're doing the talking for you. Does that make sense? In those conversations, the best thing is prompt with a question and respond. It's not, it's not putting the onus of responsibility completely on the other person, but it is instead of monologuing, let it be a back and forth. The reason why this is so important is because then you get to see what's in the gap, right? When they're telling you what your value is, you can think to yourself, ah, but I also do this really other awesome thing. I'm not showing up in that really awesome thing, or they're not seeing it, or I'm not showcasing that enough. That's gonna be really significant in, in, in having that conversation. Does that help, Violetta? Excellent. Any other, any other contexts? I just have a few more things to, to cover, but I wanna hear any other context or situations that you might be thinking of outside of uh, asking for a raise or a job interview. Okay, one of the things I want to address is limiting beliefs. The limiting beliefs is specifically for job interview. There's a lot of people that have self doubts of I'm not qualified for this job. I want to shift that mentality into thinking if you got an interview, they are trusting you with the ability to have that job. 
So you get to reflect that job back onto yourself. I'm sorry, that confidence back onto yourself. The same for any conversation. Yoletta, when you ha ask for a raise, it's the same thing. When you're, they're engaging in that process, you get to trust that you are worth whatever it is that you are worth. Questions or comments or reactions to that is reflecting the worth that you are seeing in yourself. Okay. Violetta, let's just say that we've gone through all of the questions and we've talked about, you know, your experience as a clown and it's the end of the interview. Towards the end of the interview, what's the one thing that you get to do in the interview? I get to do a handshake. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you do? Well, when I'm done asking questions, what's oh, next? Oh, okay. Got it. So when you're done asking questions, I, I, get, I think I would ask you if, um, if I could ask some questions about the job and, you know, like what a day, like an actual day looks like. Okay. Good. What other, what other questions would you ask? I would ask, you know, what, besides what is listed as the job description, what, um, what are your expectations of me? What, is there like a possibility to grow within? I mean, I guess once, I don't know, maybe I can be like a clown manager or something, you know? Um, yeah. And also I would ask about, you know, like this, I think a lot of people say it's not okay, but I, would like to ask about my salary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's good to ask for your worth for for figuring out that. Um, Emily's going to be the 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 go to on that. It really is contextual uh, in terms of asking for the salary. Sometimes they'll they'll tell you the salary right up front. Sometimes it'll go through a process. But it is. I think it is significant and important to know that ahead of time. I've been through rigorous job interviews, and then they tell me the salary, and it's significantly lower than I thought it was. And then all of a sudden I get to reject the job and there's all sorts of different uh, aspects there. What I would encourage all of you to do when you're asking questions in an interview or in a tough conversation is what obstacles do you foresee dot, dot, dot. What obstacles do you foresee? So whoever fills this position, what are some of the major obstacles that you foresee? What are some of the, the obstacles that have been here in the past? If, if you're, you're going into a conversation like getting a raise, um, what obstacles are there to improving uh, my salary given the value, okay? And then you get to address those obstacles as well. One of the reasons why I, I talk about celebrating rejection is that Sometimes it's not a good fit, not just for the person who is the interviewer. Sometimes it's not a good fit for you. The worst jobs, and I won't name them by name, but the worst jobs that I've had have been jobs where I didn't ask enough questions. I showed up and week three, I thought, oh no, this is not a good fit. This is not going well at all. So I want, want to continue to encourage you to have the courage to ask those questions. Again, courage is being afraid and doing it anyway. I have just a minute or two left, and I want to recap by saying that whatever context you are in, public speaking is any time that you open your mouth. When you get my, my one sheet summary, my email address is at the bottom, as well as a link to the Facebook group that I run. There you're gonna see some weekly speaking tips, some articles, some resources. I would love for you to join that. You'll also see some, uh, some announcements of when I do public speaking courses and classes where we create five to 10 minute little TED Talks while we're engaging into public speaking skills training. And what I really want you to take home from this is it's going to feel uncomfortable. Interviews are gonna feel uncomfortable. Difficult conversations are gonna be uncomfortable. You're gonna sweat. You're gonna, your heart is gonna pound. And when that happens, I want you to acknowledge yourself for your courage because it's only through those courageous conversations that we're gonna have effective and courageous communication.
left to answer any questions before I hand it